Good afternoon. On behalf of the Milwaukee Police Department, I want to thank the White House for recognizing us as champions of change for building bridges between youth and law enforcement. It is a privilege to be here, and I would like to congratulate the honorees for all their outstanding work. The Students Talking It Over with Police program from the City of Milwaukee is a seven-week program facilitated by police officers that teaches youth about law enforcement. We wanted students to know who we are, what we do, and why we do it. It started off as a one-time pilot initiative with the Boys and Girls Club, and it quickly grew to in over 100 schools, and we have 1,450 graduates, right. including students who have joined the Milwaukee Police Department. Our goal is to change how youth perceive the police. When they see uniformed officers for the first time, we do not want them to think that something bad is happening. We are there to help, and we want to help. The success of this program has allowed us to develop new partnerships within our community, including Erica Lofton. At 14 years old, Erica is the CEO of our own nonprofit and is working hard to reduce violence in our community. <laughs> This past summer, Eric and I joined together to distribute anti-violence bracelets to officers who, in turn, handed them out to kids as a way of starting a conversation. To date, our officers have distributed over 1,800 bracelets. Erica inspires me every day. Her energy and enthusiasm are contagious. Sorry. <laughs> it takes, yeah. If you want to remain standing, that's fine. When I look at that bracelet, I know that our community wants to work together and make our city a better place to live. Please join me in welcoming the CEO of Girls in Action, Erica Lofton. Thank you. Thanks, Officer Singleton. Now, before I get started, I want to thank Girls in Action members and their moms. If it wasn't for you, it would just be a girl in action and that would be lonely. <laughs> and a very special thanks to one of the leaders of Girls in Action, Miss Ariana Mills, who came with me today. Can you please stand up, Ariana? Let's give her a hand. She's a very, she's a very dedicated member into Girls in Action, and I'm just very thankful for you being here. Like officers, no, I'm very excited. <laughs> I'm very excited stoked, delighted, and very honored to be here in the White House. And this is so surreal to me. <laughs> like Officer Singleton said, my name is Erica, and I'm the CEO of Girls in Action, where we use teamwork to promote manners, self-esteem, social and communication skills, and we have fun. But the main mission is to help young girls become leaders. Last year, we lost a member to Girls in Action in a playground shooting. She was only 10 years old. After seeing this happen to my friend, along with other senseless deaths and shootings of children in my community, I worked with Girls in Action to come up with a solution to violence in Milwaukee. We designed a pledge bracelet that says, I don't commit violence, I speak out against it. We've given them to the Milwaukee Police Department, a juvenile justice reentry program, and the Milwaukee, the Milwaukee County Department of Corrections. The feedback has been really good, and one probation officer even said, and I quote, the offenders have started to use, the offenders I have started to use this have appeared to really like it. Now, you may be wondering why I chose to work with the MPD. When a citizen sees an officer wearing the bracelet, that will send a message of trust, a positive message. And if the youth get positive messages from the MPD, there will be more trust and a mutual respect for one another. I must say, it feels good to know that something as simple as a violence prevention pledge bracelet can help bridge gaps between youth and law enforcement. For that, I am grateful, and I hope our campaign makes a positive impact on violence. Now, it is my pleasure, pleasure to introduce someone who has been described as a champion for all of us and has spent decades in public service. The Vice President of our United States of America, Vice President Joe Biden. <laughs> Thank you very much.
Erica, we're clapping for you. I want to check really how old you are. Please, everybody sit down. I want, quote, the adults in the room to raise their hand if they had ever used the word surreal when they were 14. I, uh, at age 28, kiddo, I didn't have the poise you have at 14. And I think I should begin to call you Madam President now. I want to be the first one to have said it. <laughs> Folks, you know, uh, uh, the more time passes, the more things uh, going back to what existed before, as you know, buddy. What we're really talking about here, and I got a chance to meet all of the champions of change. And by the way, for those of you who don't know, uh, the White House does this not just for law enforcement, but all across the spectrum. People who are champions of change and everything from technology to healthcare to a whole range of things. But this is, uh, this is an issue that is uh, um, what we're doing today is using all of you who are here today being honored as evidence of what we've already known but has sort of fallen by the wayside. Way back uh, 150 years ago when I wrote the crime bill, <laughs> everybody today talks about it like it was about increasing penalties. It didn't increase penalties. States did that and a lot of other things, the sentencing commission arranged, but not the crime bill. A third of all the money in the crime bill was for prevention. We tried to divert children from prison, the young people from prison, and with drug courts we set up. They weren't supposed to be put in prison. They were supposed to go into drug courts and be referred to rehabilitation centers and get help. And the essence of the legislation was a very controversial notion back uh, in 1994. It was called the community policing. And, you know, uh, Chief Bratton, Commissioner Bratton up in New York, who was a commissioner in Los Angeles and a commissioner in Boston, he's had a number of uh, uh, important jobs. He told me a story about there was a woman who, uh, in, an African-American activist in Los Angeles, who every time he see she'd see him she'd use a maasai the, the maasai tribe in africa had an expression when they see you when, when they greet you and the expression is translated to english i see you i see you that's the opening greeting i see you what it means is i value you i see you i respect you as another human being i see you the problem today because we cut funding for community policing nationally beginning in the beginning of the Bush administration by 87 percent. It's awful hard for these law enforcement agencies to have people walk in the neighborhood being out. It's a in highly intensive, uh, resource-intensive undertaking. It used to be, when we first passed that legislation and put another 100,000 law enforcement people on the street, the only way a police department could get federal funding for a a cop at the time, a police officer, was they had to add to what already their roster was. They couldn't replace police officers. And you had to be out in the community. And violent crime dropped precipitously around America because law enforcement officers did what you all are doing now. They set up skateboard parks. They provided for criminal justice training in uh, in schools. They talked about going through the neighborhoods and reaching out to people and ending homelessness. That's what used to happen. It used to be, at a time back from 94 to about 2001, police officers knew the name, not generically, knew the name of the man or woman who ran the corner grocery store. Knew the name of the people who lived on the block, gave their card 
to those individuals and said, if there's a problem, call me directly on my cell phone. And people did, because they knew the law enforcement officer wasn't going to give the person away. I remember one case in Philadelphia, a woman had a lot of drug activity outside her apartment on the corner, a particular corner. But she knew if she called the police directly, they'd, they'd show up, say that she had reported them, and then when those guys got out of jail, they'd come back and get her. So when the local police officer doing community policing had given her his card, she knew that when he, she dialed that number, frightened dialing the number, and saying there's action going down, there's a drug deal going outside my house, he'd never give her away. He'd never give her away. I was with Chuck Canterbury, who's the uh, head of the FOP, just a moment ago in my office. Three of the officers, I think, today are members of the FOP. He was telling me when the crime bill was passed, the community policing was passed, in his hometown, the police department he still belongs to, that they set up in every neighborhood, like in Wilmington, Delaware, my hometown, many precincts just an abandoned house, a place where they, everyone knew that the local law enforcement officer would be there. He said, and we ended violent crime, basically, in the neighborhood. He said, now my son is a police officer, and that house I used to work out of is a crack house. There's no law enforcement officers in the community, because we've cut their funding. I can't get a hard estimate of how many local law enforcement officers, local departments have been cut, are unable to fill their quotas because salaries are flat. The job is tough. So one of the recommendations when we put together, the President put together this task force on what should we be doing, it wasn't just body cameras and all the things and, and not riding into town with an up-armored Humvee into a neighborhood, et cetera. He said, we're going to focus on community policing, drug diversion. There's no reason why nonviolent criminals, kids of the first offense, should be in jail for a drug offense. People were designed to put in jail were the dealers. There's a whole lot more we could talk about. But the thing I'm so happy about being here, it is not hyperbole to suggest that you officers who are here today are champions of change. I know the Portland example because my son, out of college, ran an emergency service shelter in the largest abandoned, basically, Catholic parish and Catholic high school out there, joining the Jesuit Volunteer Corps. People are in the streets, touching people. I see you. I see you. What's happened now? A lot of the neighborhoods that need the most help, the community doesn't see that law enforcement officer sitting in her squad car. They don't know that she has two kids at home and loves to play basketball. And the law enforcement officer in a tough neighborhood looks at a corner and sees a kid with dreadlocks and sees a gangbanger instead of a kid who has the opportunity to be a great poet or author. I see you. The truth is we're not seeing each other anymore very much. And so the uh, whole idea of the President's task force in the 21st century policing is get more police officers into the communities to better know the residents, to work together to make neighborhoods safer. That's a great idea, kiddo. I'm not joking, because you're exactly right. The value isn't that the person who wears it is committed. The value is, in large part, a police officer wears it and says, I get it. I understand the neighborhood. 
My son used to be the Attorney General of the State of Delaware. And he became one of the few Attorneys General, and the Attorney General in Delaware has more power, not because he was my son, but the way the Constitution is written, <laughs> than any Attorney General in the United States, because in Delaware, the Attorney General's office is the only one that can prosecute any felony. There's no local DAs, there's no county attorneys, only the Attorney General. They all work for my son or now the new Attorney General as my son passed away. And written into the crime bill was another provision. And the other provision was that there be community prosecutors. What that meant was the prosecutors would actually go out and hold town meetings in the community, walk in and sit down Community and ask the community what's going on. Because guess what? Everybody in the community knows who is committing most of the crimes. Career criminals, a study I did 20 years ago, 7% of all the criminals commit about over 50% of all the crimes. So they'd sit and they'd say, and they'd whisper and say, an awful lot of local law enforcement people have been put in a tough bind because mayors, county executives, city councils, police officers aren't the one right to draft a law that says you've got to stop and frisk. They're concerned about it. Police officers are the one to say, you know, here, here's what we're going to do. We're, we're going to flood the neighborhood. I got a great idea. Let's drive in an up-armored Humvee when we've got a problem. I'm not joking. The cop on the beat's not the one. They only carry out what the elected officials tell them the law is, what they want to do. So what I'm really excited about here, by the way, all of these five or six that are being honored today, law enforcement officers, stand up again. I just want the people to see. Stand up. I don't want to just, I don't want you to just recognize the people are doing good. These folks went out and said, I got an idea. I got an idea. I figured out how we got to get engaged in the community. They didn't sit in their cars and their offices. They went out and it's the community. There's a great skateboard in this young man. You say, oh, skateboard, what's that? Guess what? You guys can sit down. <laughs> Guess what? You know what I found out when I wrote the crime bill? You know what had the biggest impact on violent crime in comparable neighborhoods in projects? And then we, we compared four neighborhoods where the public housing project exists at high rises. Where there was a, in the basement of the high rise, the Boys and Girls Club, the violent crime rate was down over 27%. And guess what? Boys and Girls Clubs are a great operation, but guess what? Every, every Republican and Democratic businessman is on the board of a Boys and Girls Club. So we put $20 million in the Boys and Girls Club. And they had skate parks. They had midnight basketball. They kept school gymnasiums open after the schools closed so there's some place to go. Raise your hand if you're a community and that stuff is going on now. Not many. Not many. But those who are fighting for it, it matters. <coughs> and the thing that excites me about this is the self-initiative here. But folks, you know, there's bad apples in every bunch. There are bad senators, there are bad vice presidents, there are bad presidents, there are bad cops, there are bad nurses, there are bad everywhere. 
So we've seen some bad cops lately, and it's been highlighted. We've got to give the good cops, we've got to give them some ammunition, and not, I don't mean ammo. <laughs> Today we expect law enforcement to solve the social problems in the middle of a poor neighborhood. Come on, man. I have really nicely written statements my my staff draft. <laughs> saying, let's go back to what we used to do. I'll close with a, with a comment, a statistic. When, in 1994, the community policing legislation was passed, it was a very close vote, but it passed. On an open-ended question in the Gallup poll, they asked the American people, what one thing would you like your government most to work on? And if memory serves me, oh wait, it's, I'm getting close. I'm not positive the exact But my recollection was 37% of the American people said crime. Could have been 34, could have been 39, but in the mid-30s. That same poll was taken this past spring. You know what percent of the American people said crime? 3%. Because crime is way down all over America, except some neighborhoods that need help. Now, the reason I bother to tell you that is, in fairness to mayors and county executives and local elected officials, if you have pressure in your city to restore a park, build a new youth center, deal with better street lighting, or maintain the police force, you do the street lighting. Because only 3% of the people are really concerned about crime. It leaves an awful lot of people out. So I'm not being, I'm not picking on local law enforcement, local officials. And let's get something straight. Chief of police can do no more than what the mayor lets or her. So what you're doing, I'm going to use to the best of my ability as a catalyst to try to continue to get back to basics here. It's not going to change a whole lot. And by the way, police now are feeling put upon. Although the total number of police shot and killed is not up compared to what it was before. But if you're a local cop, you're feeling kind of put upon in a lot of places. Like you may be a target because of the obvious targets that occur. If you're in the neighborhood, you begin to think, my kid's not safe when I let him out the door because they'll mistake him for a gangbanger. We've got to fix this. We've got to fix this. 
you got to fix it. And the way to fix it is I see you. And the only way you can see me is for me to get out of the car. The only way you can see me is for me to show up in a skate park. Excuse, as they used to say in the Senate, the point of personal privilege. I used to work in the east side of Wilmington, Delaware. I coincidentally happened to be the only Caucasian who worked in that area because I was a lifeguard in the big city. And, uh, and in the area that's in the projects, the area now called the Bucket. And it has a pretty high crime rate. My son, Bo, used to drive down with a cop plain clothes in his car. And there are two big basketball courts down there. If you want a game, you want to play basketball, that's the place to show up. And he get out of his car with his then six-year-old son, my grandson is now nine, and he'd go over and he'd hang out with the guys playing ball. Basketball wasn't his sport, he was okay, but he wasn't as good as those guys were. He played football and soccer. And, um, and they talked to him. They knew him. They got to know him. He was the chief law enforcement officer in the state, but he showed up where they lived. And he occasionally, there might be a patrolman in the city, he'd go over and knock on the window and say, get out of your car. Get out of your car. You know what I'm talking about. <coughs> We got to change the atmosphere, guys. We have, a, we have an obligation to keep every citizen in our cities, our counties, our cities <coughs> safe. And the single best way to do that is for them to actually build a relationship. No, not every police officer has to be a social worker. We ask an awful lot of them already. But just let us see who you are. It's still dangerous. If the danger goes down in direct proportion to the community believing you are here to help me. You're here to help me. You're here to protect my children. You'll be able to know the difference between my kid and the kid with the clock. So guys, for all of you who are here to honor the people who are honoring today, I say stay with us. Because we're, we're, we're going to grab hold of this. The president are absolutely committed. Absolutely committed. Law enforcement officers are decent, honorable women and men. The vast, vast majority are doing everything in their power to make communities safe and honor the Constitution. And honor the Constitution. The vast majority of people in the neighborhoods are decent, honorable people. They just want it to be right. There's a small percentage that are a criminal element that is real. There's a small percentage of law enforcement who abuses their power. We can't let that cloud our vision about what this is all about. Sorry to take this much time. <laughs> and I'm really not sorry because I need we need you. We need the people in this room. <coughs> we need the law enforcement. I'm telling you. Every one of the law enforcement organizations I've been working with for longer than you can imagine. Ask any one of them, ask the press, ask any one of them whether I've ever not been absolutely straight. We want to do it the right way. We've got to give them the resources, and we've got to be more like the people around here today. Thank you for letting me talk to you. As my grandfather would say, every time we walk out of this house, we'd say, Joey, keep the faith. And my grandmother would yell, no, Joey, spread it. <laughs> <laughs>